What is up, guys? Welcome back to Behind the Studio Podcast. We have a mini episode for you today. I have Dylan here with me. Uh, What's to up, everyone? Talk with me about uh, Henri Cartier Bresson. He is um, a favorite artist of mine um, that I learned about just like going through college and, and majoring in photography. And so I don't know. I just wanted to kind of talk about him and discuss some of his like photography philosophies with uh, someone else, and you know, kind of see like what bring what kind of conversation that brings up. So yeah. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and get right into it. Um, first of all, Dylan, have you ever heard this guy's name? No, I don't. I didn't major in photography. <laughs> I did a little bit of art, um, like history back in the day when I was a young college lad, but I don't remember all that mess. So yeah. I don't know this cat. And like most of the times when you learn about art historians or like art history, it's like Van Gogh not exactly. and like, like Renaissance not painters. And, yeah. Um, which I loved learning about photo history in college. I think that was like one of my favorite parts was like, you know, you had never talked about it before. And also just it being like one of my favorite mediums, like I got to talk about that. So I got to learn about that. But um, anyways, uh, we actually, funny enough, saw Henri Cartier's Persson's work in, in Noma. In Noma. Uh, Do you remember oh, the that picture that almost like pretty much crying? made me cry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about him today too. So, and from now on, just so I can avoid the tongue twister, I'm going to start saying just Brisson. So, croissant. Yeah, because it's just such a long name. Kind of like croissant. Croissant. I'm going to just Bras say croissant. Croissant, okay. <laughs> I'm sure he's rolling in his grave <laughs> hearing about that. So, um, to start off, uh, Brisson was a French photographer. He was uh, born in France in 1908. Um, and just like, you know, he had a lot of like early upbringing in art. Uh, he was a painter earlier on. And then I think also um, he came from like an artist background. I think his family was all involved in it as well. Um, but later on in his life as a photographer, um, starting at kind of, I think in his like twenties or thirties, um, he co-founded a, uh, photography collective called Magnum Photos in 1947 with a lot of other like now famous photographers. Um, that was basically just a photography cooperative who did a lot for like photojournalism today and they still exist today as well. A lot of famous and, and really like skilled and, and talented photographers are a part of that agency and they kind of go out and do their own projects. And the cool thing about Magnum is they all have um, like rights to their photos as well. So they take them, it goes into journalism. It's like, you know, they're pretty much, they do like these big projects on these certain things, but then all their photos are still represented as their own, which is really, really great. That is cool. Fun fact about their name. Uh, so Magnum, you think of a gun, but also there's like a, um, kind of like a rumor that they started that name because like every time, like every so often when they would meet, they would have champagne bottles, which I just learned in this research that Magnum champagne bottles are like the biggest bottles of champagne you can get. I had not. no idea. Yeah, me either. I was like, I don't know. I was trying to figure out that, like why it just like why they, named they would have champagne and they named it Magnum. I assumed it was somebody else's last name or like a combination of last names because you said it was co-founded, yes. right? So like, it wasn't just him. So I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. Just, you know, he got a C in his name, Magnum. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe so they actually, added some things up. They, I think there were there were like five or six or even like maybe seven photographers who all founded this together. So I think that's also really cool. It's just like, like, I think like as an artist and as like someone who's like met with like other people and, and kind of, I guess, majored in art. It's like, you know, your collective and your like your community of artists are all really important. And so it's like really cool that they like came together as photographers to start this really important company that still exists today. Um, but then also just with the name, like photography is just pretty much known to have a lot of like gun lingo in it. So like obviously shooting Shoot, a photo yeah. and it's also like, you have your trigger, you know, things like that. And so that was also another like rumor as to why huh. it was called Magnum. Is yeah. That is a good, a good thought. I wonder if that had a little bit to like go with it. They're like, Oh, mm. we all, we have this champagne and this, this makes sense in multiple reasons. Yeah. Or who knows, maybe they had a completely different reason and just all these rumors are fake. I don't really know, but that's what my research led me to. Um, so, yeah, so he was a photojournalist who is pretty much considered the father of photojournalism. Like, the way that we see photojournalists now and the way they take photos is, like, the way that he was kind of doing it, like, from the beginning. And he's the one who is, like, kind of, like, set and paved the way for, like, how it's done today, which is, like, one thing that I really love because I think just, like even just early on into like me, like learning about photography, I've always been interested in street photography. And then just like, I would watch people do it like on YouTube or like look up 
you know, certain street photographers and, you know, see what kind of things that they would do. Even just like, there used to be a lot of like TikToks that I would watch of people doing street photography and it always really interested me. Um, but he was doing it in a really interesting way, especially for that time, um, which I'll get into just a little bit later. Um, but doing, doing photography for a long time and, and being like pretty much a, a huge influence in it, he wrote a book called, I'm going to butcher this, um, Images a la Sauvette. Um, that sounded pretty good. We'll yeah, send it. Sounded French to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this was basically his glimpse into photography, the way like he saw it, the way he did it, and like pretty much had this very large foreword on like everything that he knew and, and wanted to teach about photography and philosophies that he kind of like held true to himself as, as he was doing it, as well as a lot of the photos that he took as well. Um, which directly translated, the French title means images on the fly or images taken quickly or things like that. But when it was translated into English, it was translated after one of the philosophies in the book that he kind of talked about um, and ended up becoming pretty famous called The Decisive Moment. And so that was just something that he like was like one of his most like important philosophies behind taking a picture. And basically... Um, for some reason, just whenever they translated into English and, and did that, that's what they just ended up calling the book. And now that's what the book is just known as. Which do you prefer? Would you have preferred it to be images on the fly? I would have. So, I'd say it's a really good debate because I like the decisive moment just as a photography philosophy. And so I like that, like, just because that's so closely related to him, that's being now the name of the book is understandable. I don't know if that was like also like a, a him kind of like decision or if that was just like it happened and that's the way it was. Hmm. But I think that images on the fly makes photography as a whole sound more approachable instead of the decisive, the moment. decisive moment. Sounds like something I'm not interested in like being a part of. Like it sounds like too much decision needs to go in place. Yeah, a little more <laughs> conceptual. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to talk about what the decisive moment actually is. Um, it's a pretty interesting philosophy and that's also kind of what made his like photography specifically like pretty interesting was um i'm going to describe a definition that i found like the first time i ever researched it and it sounds so complicated like like i think that it took me so long to actually understand what this sentence meant and then i had to actually give it like my own definition because i don't think this is like this isn't the way he described it in the book this is just what it is understood as being so in my research, that led me to the definition of the decisive moment being capturing an event that is ephemeral and spontaneous where the image represents the essence of the event itself. What are your thoughts on that? It's a, it's a little... It's a lot of words to say a, nothing. Yeah. Not nothing, but to basically say the moment, like taking a photo of a moment that represents mm -hmm. what you're looking at. Yeah. With a bunch of you know, $5 words in there. <laughs> yeah. So it is really interesting, but the way, like, I just think there's a lot of definitions just because again, like it's given it's a philosophy that is, was not, you know, necessarily, um, there's no true definition. Um, right. I think and I mean, it's just, from the forties and like other people have like also put in their, like yeah. their take on his, his mm -hmm. philosophy. You know what I'm saying? So like, it's, it's a bunch of different things yeah. leading to that. And it's it's kind of changed ever since then because photography has changed a lot ever since he like put time into it. So for myself, the a simpler way of looking at that definition of or when I think of the decisive moment, to me that's something that is um, like instead of like when you're taking a picture, instead of thinking about what you're taking a picture of, whether it be the subject you're taking a picture of, or you know you're taking a picture of a car, or you're taking a picture of a building. It's like the moment itself that you're taking a picture of. So basically you're kind of like, you're kind of looking through your camera, like you're waiting for something to happen. And as soon as you think that that moment happens, you take a picture and that moment is what you're taking a picture of rather than what is in the photo, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the way I look at it. Um, and I think that that's like a really big thing. And I mean, you, you can see it in his images. You can see it in a lot of like even photojournalism, street photography. Um, like obviously people are like kind of, picking and choosing these moments that they want to showcase. Um, and so, and I have, and this is where, this is where a bike in the wind and yeah. fish in the river and a couple saying goodbye comes into play. So um, for, as an example of this, so like, let's say you're, you're walking around and there's like a really heavy wind and you see 
a bike that's just kind of like loose and doing whatever. And you're like, okay, that bike is definitely going to fall over in this wind. So I'm going to wait for that. And then once that bike starts falling over, that's when you capture that picture. Same thing with fish in a river. You're like, you know, occasionally fish will swim up a river and they'll jump out and they'll do whatever. So you're like, okay, at wait the, for some that point, to hop up. I think a fish is going to jump out. So huh. I'm going to kind of chill here. I'm going to wait for that to happen. And then once that happens, that's when I'm snapping that picture. And then a couple saying goodbye. And so you're taking some picture of a picture of some people and like you're hanging around and like you see like, this is a really cute moment. Let me wait for them to hug or embrace or kiss. Like obviously that that's going to happen at some point. They're saying goodbye or maybe it doesn't, but that's like the moment you're waiting for as opposed to like, oh, I'm just going to snap a picture of them until I get that one picture, you know, like it's like you're like waiting for that moment. That's where I think it comes into play nowadays of like why it's such an interesting concept and why it might seem less or more important to a lot of people because photography has changed. Back then, I think it was impressive and important to Brisson because, like, as a film photographer, it was impressive because you're not, you don't have like an SD card with a right. thousand photos. So you got to get it right the one time. Mm -hmm. And so that brings into to play and like the idea of like, is this like, does that even matter now? Like, are pictures more or less valuable because we can take more or less like I think that's just like a, a really interesting part but also I just love still the philosophy of like like I'm I'm still very much like I love taking pictures of the film I right. did my senior project for on film and um and whatnot and so that's what I think I love the most about film photography is that like each frame is valuable and so like I have to like either either I'm waiting for those moments or I'm like picking and choosing my film, like, you know, my 36 images or my 28, like very choosily, choice, choicely. Um, that's what I'm like, I'm curious. Like, what do you think about that? Is it still impressive what he was doing there during that time? So I think obviously is without a doubt more impressive mm -hmm. back then, you know, because like you said, you have just a handful of film that you be, you have to look at and be like, all right, I need to decide when the right moment is. And I think whereas now, um, I don't think it's less important because we still have to to capture that same moment. Yeah. I think now we just have to be more intentional on anticipating it mm -hmm. because like because things happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's you have this thing where things happen quickly. We can also take photos quickly, but on the the very front end of that, we have to anticipate that thing happening yeah. before. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So like whereas these other things, like yes, obviously you have to anticipate a bike and a heavy wind. Fish and River, all these kinds of things. But, like, you... It's almost because you chose these things to select, you you already kind of have an idea of what you're going to be looking for. Yeah. Does that make sense? As yeah. opposed to, like, constantly looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was listening to another podcast on this, um, and I can't remember. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes if I, if I go back to my research. But they were talking about this as well. And, um, you know, they had two sides, and... and the woman had brought up like, uh, or the, the man was talking about how like, oh, like it's like, you know, it's, it's like less valuable and it's, it's like less interesting because like, you know, now that we can take tons and tons of photos, we can, you know, we, we don't care about those photos as much, but she brought up that someone learning and someone like seeing Brisson's work, then being able to learn and take it more photos, they're able to like then train a little bit better and know what to look for. Yeah. And so then like they can like kind of like the more photos they can take, the more they can kind of train themselves down and be like, okay, now I now I know what I'm doing. Right. And, and can think, get better. Like even mm -hmm. think of like when we when we first started, like we would always be super trigger happy in taking photos and, and like am. always <laughs> taking, you know, we might take a million photos yeah. or whatever. But now like we anticipate, we know what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen. So like it's we there's less pressure for us to to get it right because you know, we know that we're going to kind of thing. Yeah. And a lot of times, like just even with like lifestyle and, and wedding photography too, it's like you already know you're, you're posing. Right. And so there's a difference in that too is like street photography is much different than wedding photography right. because like you have to like set it up. And so like, but the other thing is, is like you get better with posing and you get better with knowing what you want to do. So still you're taking less photos eventually as you're yeah. doing it because you know what you want and then you know what you don't have to take a photo right. of, which is really great. Um, she all, and also that brings up the decisive moment can also, I feel like at this point, since everything's changed, can also come up within the culling process of photos. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you have a lot of photos from that moment, 
but you know what you're choosing. Right. Yeah, you exactly. Know, like the ones that you want to showcase. The ones that you want to deliver, like in mm-hmm. our case. So yeah, like showcase, like you, you, you might have more to choose from, but mm-hmm. I think that you have a better opportunity to choose the correct decisive mm-hmm. moment as opposed to being like, well, this is the one I got. Yeah. As opposed to being like, well, mm. this is the one I chose to get. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, for sure. And that's that's another thing that I think of too, because I mean, obviously I deal with both mediums, film and digital. And so like, I try and keep it in mind, like when I'm doing my own projects and stuff, like taking a photo of like when the right moment is, even when it's digital, but I'm still, I'm still going to be trigger happy because I can be. Right. I can still take more photos because exactly. ultimately like I can still choose the right photos in the calling process. Right. And so once I see the right photo, like, and I'm editing, I'm like, okay, that's the photo I wanted when I was taking these photos. And then, you know, all the rest of those 10 of that set I can get rid of. And I have that one great one. Right. And to go back to even like the, the bike and the heavy wind, like imagine we're taking that on digital, right? And like, let's, I don't know what his looks like. If he, even if that so that's, like no, these are none of his images. These oh, are okay. just like examples that I thought of. Well, like imagining like, you know, you, with film, you're getting the bike in one spot being that is just what you got. Yeah. Whereas like you can almost get the entire fall Mm -hmm. and have your decisive moment be when it's three inches from the ground as opposed to, you know, three foot from the ground. Like, I think, like you said, having that in the calling process just helps you differentiate yourself, I think, and choose, you know, like you said, what you want the decisive moment to be as Mm -hmm. opposed to like, well, this is because I mean, ultimately, it's like what it, it is, what it is yeah. when it's on film. It's like, well, that I guess is the size of the moment. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Which I think, like, there's just like there's a lot of like different ways to think about that. Like, that's one thing I love about film is that it is what it is, whatever I take a picture of. But I mean, it just can still differ with film and digital. Um, and that's also why I think that this above definition is so interesting because, like, I think when depending on who you are and depending on how you're looking at the decisive moment, a lot of people can think, oh, like the reason why that's so important or the reason why it's only so important to like get the one photo is because like, well, if you're taking a a picture of a bunch of moments, then you're just killing it. Like that, that moment is like, you know, it's no longer ephemeral because you're taking so many of that and or so many of that instance. And so now like the one photo that you were trying to get, doesn't matter because all other instances exist. I think that's just what, what a lot of pe- other people think about when they think of it. And so I just think it's an interesting concept still to this day. I mean, he's still one of my favorite photographers, but I also like easily recognize that photography's changed and that like things change and things might still be a little different. Right. But you know, who's to say what's wrong and what's right? I mean, that, that that's the great thing about photography is like ultimately like there's two people that say something is good the person that took it and the person that's viewing it Mm -hmm. and like you know that like a picture can speak to you very differently than it does to me yeah you know like you can look at a picture of a brick (laughs) and be like wow (laughs) it's the greatest thing ever and then i can look at it and be like that's a brick that's a brick (laughs) or vice versa you know what i'm saying like um think of like looking at a picture of a couple that you have no ties to like that's just a Mm -hmm. like think about like (laughs) the photos in like the the frames you get, you know, when you buy them from like oh. Walmart, like that's just a random couple, right? Yeah. But if you change that and it's me and Danielle, I'm like, that's my beautiful wife, right? Yeah. So like, I think it's just, it's just very different. Um, and it's mm-hmm. such a like subjective medium and mm-hmm. like that's part of what makes it it's great and yeah. not great. <laughs> For sure. Well, that's pretty much all I have. I had his work in these papers because I thought that at some point I would come and look at it, but um, maybe I'll just drop them in the show notes and that let you decide for yourself what you think of Prasant's work. But anyways, thank you for joining me today on this podcast. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys for joining us, whether you're listening or watching. Um, And be on the lookout for more mini episodes. Thank you guys so much. See you soon. Peace.